Hi, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Father Bill W. I am an Episcopal priest living here in Austin, Texas, and I've had the gift of recovery for the past 47 years. I've done that through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I am forever grateful uh, to those who taught me all along the way. Um, I hope you have visited our website. It's called twowayprayer.org. It'll teach you some of the practices that we're going to be talking about in this particular episode. Um, If the uh, practice turns out to be helpful, I hope you'll share uh, this podcast with friends. Um, We're trying to get this information out to as many people as we can in 12-step recovery. And finally, then, if you have any comments on the on the series, uh, any one of the series, please drop me a line. It's always good to hear from folks out there and know the uh, uh, programs are having their intended effect. You can you can reach me at twowayprayer at gmail dot com. And so, uh, in this episode, we're continuing our series on the spiritual origins of the AA program trying to discover how our 12-step programs emerged out of the Oxford group. What are the things we took with us into the 12-step world, and what are the things we left behind? Uh, We're using a a 1938 book titled The Eight Points of the Oxford Group. It was by C. Irving Benson, and you can download it for free, or you can buy a reproduced copy of it from Amazon, the eight points of the Oxford group. And this episode is on chapter six in Benson's book. And it's got kind of a catchy title. It's it's called Don't Be an Ass. And this this, um, chapter is about receiving guidance through two-way prayer. And and the ass is a reference to that stubborn man or woman who chooses to follow their own will when uh, we're really only, only going to find peace uh, through the discovery of God's will and uh, be willing to do it. So uh, I can certainly act like an ass sometimes and uh, do my own will. Um, I don't know that I've ever gotten through a whole day yet uh, living by the absolutes and 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 being perfectly honest, pure, unselfish, and loving all my uh, contacts and interactions, but but it's through the failings uh, that that I learn, and so um, uh, same is probably true for you as well. So uh, um, I, I guess I'll invite my fellow asses out there to join in and listen, and let's get started. So Benson begins uh, his chapter on guidance with a quote. There's kind of a famous quote from Oxford Group founder Dr. Frank Bookman. And Bookman said this, said, divine guidance must become the normal experience of ordinary men and women. Any man can pick up divine messages if he will put his receiving set in order. Definite, accurate, adequate information can come from the mind of God to the mind of men. This, Bookman said, is normal prayer. Now, I think that kind of prayer has pretty much been lost in our 12-step programs, but it was absolutely key for the Oxford Group members uh, and for the early AA pioneers. That was the kind of prayer that they practiced uh, in a quiet time, which was addressed in uh, one of our other podcasts. So here, here are some of the traces. I, I, I wanted you to know that uh, um, the big book begins to make more sense if you have a good understanding of the history. <clears throat> and so I, I took some uh, quotes from the, uh, the part of the big book where it's talking about the 11th step, practicing prayer and meditation. And, uh, and, and I want you to see that, that what's being referred to here is really a reference to guidance. And uh, boy, I read it for 20 years and never understood that. <clears throat> but it was only after getting into the history that some of this stuff started making sense. So here's, here's some quotes. Before we begin, we ask God to direct our thinking. 
So, I mean, th- th- there's, there's the reference that, that in this quiet time, when I'm doing my two-way prayer, God is in some way, shape, or form going to be directing my thinking. Um, they believed that they, not all thoughts coming to them were from God, but there would be what they called luminative thoughts, thoughts that stood out from others, thoughts that were atypical, not typical of my usual ego state. And that if I, if I began this practice and stayed with this practice, uh, my thinking would begin to change. <clears throat> our thought life will be placed on a much higher plane when our thinking is cleared of wrong motives. Now, what the Oxford Group people believed was that if you brought to the practice of, of in your prayer and meditation of an individual who was trying to live by the four standards of honesty, purity, unselfishness, and love, that, that, that then we would be guided by God. If, if, if we came without that intention, if our intentions were not clean and clear and honest, then guidance is, 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 is not nearly as likely. Um, the big book kind of says it this way, and this is sort of a similar reference. It says, we pray that our thinking be divorced from self-pity, dishonesty, or self-seeking motives. So, so uh, it's not that I just sit down and automatically I take out my pen and, and, and paper and, and God's just going to send me a message clear and simple. It's going to be that I'm trying to live my life on the basis of, of A, surrendering my will to God, B, uh, practicing the absolutes, and then C, receiving the guidance and direction that he will then give to me because I am really attempting to be his instrument in the world. Um, It goes on in the big book, it says, when we face indecision, we ask God for inspiration, an intuitive thought. We relax and do not struggle. We're often surprised how the right answers come after we have tried this for a while. What used to be the hunch or the occasional inspiration gradually becomes a working part of the mind. Well, again, if, you, if you'll remember that the Oxford group had its heyday just before the outbreak of World War II it was in the 1930s. And what Bookman was convinced of was that if, uh, if, if a number of individuals didn't begin living guided lives, uh, getting their inspiration from God, that taking the guidance that they receive and doing it in the world, uh, there was going to be another world war. Um, he, he suffered uh, the experience in Europe, particularly of uh, the consequences of World War I, and said if, if there's not a new kind of Christianity, there's going to be a second world war, that Nazism and fascism and capitalism and socialism, none of these things are really going to change the world. The only thing that's going to change the world is individuals who are listening to God, give them guidance, and then perform that guidance in, in, the, in the world. Um, big book cautions, we're not going to be inspired at all times, and we may pay for this presumption in all sor- sorts of absurd actions and ideas. But they go on to say, but it's worth it, you know? Not everything that comes to me during a, a quiet time, uh, a two-way prayer session, is, is going to be directly from God. Uh, I've been doing this for 27 years, and I know that. The ego can slip in. It can really fool me. And, and so I have to be careful. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about checking on the guidance in just a minute. Uh, but at the beginning of the day, we ask God to show us his will for that day. And then we, we write down the thoughts that come. Um, so I, I'd encourage, I don't have time to get into all of the process stuff here, but if you'll go and watch the videos on Two Way Prayer website, uh, you'll learn the process if you haven't done that already. Now, 
when I when I reflect back on what did I understand of this when I came into the program, it wasn't a heck of a lot. Um, I mean, I knew it was important to do God's will, but the about the only thing I understood of God's will, and this I got really clear, God's will for me as an alcoholic was don't drink. I was really clear on that one. There's no way in hell uh, I could even convince myself that it was God's will for me to uh, to pick up a drink. It was not his will. And I also knew, and this, this was a little bit more individual, but I knew that it, his will for me was that I not run. I had been a runner all my life. Uh, when things got tight, when, when things got bad, uh, I, I would just get out of Dodge. And and I knew if I didn't stick it out, if I didn't go through the pain this time, um, I, I wasn't going to make it. So don't drink and don't run. The, those are about as, as the most that I knew really uh, definitively of what was God's will for me. But nobody really taught me about this idea of seeking personal guidance that God will guide me in, uh, in, my, in my daily actions, uh, that God really cared enough about me personally, that it made a difference to God whether or not I sought out and followed his will. But, you know, I really believe now that, that that's where the meaning and the purpose come in, uh, in sobriety. Um, that it makes a difference not only to me, but it actually makes a difference to God, whether whether I am following his will, becoming his friend, uh, starting to rely upon him, um, and, and, um, and the world won't be the same. This is something that I've, I've come to see really, really clearly. Um, you know, sometimes you think, oh my God, there's seven billion people in the world. What, what difference does my little life make? Well, I mean, that's thinking like a normal ego would would think, but it's not the way God thinks. The way God thinks, I, I suspect, is that there need to be, just for starters, seven billion people to reflect him in the world. And each one is unique, and each one is important. And if, and if the consciousness of those individuals starts to get raised, then God can become more and more present in our world. I don't know that everybody's got to get it, but some of us have got to get it. And some of us are called, I think, to go deeper in the program. My first sponsor used to talk about limit a process he called limited conversions. He said there are a lot of people in AA who just kind of got enough to get by, just get enough to stay sober, not drink, you know, and they're happy with that. Well, some of us are either sicker than others or more sensitive than others. I'm not sure which one it is. But not drinking after a while just is not enough for me. I mean, it's the start, and, and I never want to forget that start. But it's not the end. Uh, the conversion has to go deeper. Uh, the reliance upon God has to shift not only towards staying sober, but towards staying sane. And the way I stay sane is to be in conscious contact with God and, and, and allowing the thoughts that he has to come into my life to guide me through life. So uh, <clears throat> back to Benson uh, on, on his chapter here. I want to hit a few of the key points. And he starts off by uh, referring us to Scripture. Remember, he was, he was a Methodist minister down in Australia back in the 30s. And uh, so he's grounded in scripture. He's grounded in uh, the Christian faith. And, and he says this, scripture is filled with examples of God giving guidance. He looks at the Old Testament in the lives of the patriarchs, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, and, um, and each one is, 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 is God-guided in his life. Um, then he, he talks a little bit about the prophets. Uh, each one of the prophets, you know, hear what the Lord says. Thus says the Lord. The, the, so, so in some way, shape, or form, God was speaking to these individuals 
through these individuals uh, to, to perform certain actions uh, in the world. And in many cases, it's through visions. Uh, we're not real comfortable with that. Uh, I did my share of acid in the 60s, but uh, uh, we're not talking about that kind of vision. We're, but 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 to to um, to think creatively, to have a vision for what God is calling me to do, that's something different. To have dreams, God spoke to individuals through their dreams. Uh, in Jungian uh, analysis, dreams play an extremely important role. That that it is through the unconscious that God. Uh, is because they would say God works through the unconscious, that God is trying to reach us with messages, with, with uh, symbols uh, for actions that we need to take in our lives. In the New Testament, uh, guidance may be even more pronounced. Uh, Benson says the life of Christ was emphatically a guided life. And at times, Jesus is sure at all times, excuse me, at all times, Jesus is sure he is fulfilling the Father's will. Um, he, it's like there was communication. Uh, Jesus' 11th step was a heck of a lot better than mine. When he's seeking through prayer and meditation the knowledge of God's will for him, uh, it's very clear. And, and there's not much ego to get in the way of that. My ego can get in the way. I don't feel good. I don't want to do this, you know? Well, <clears throat> Jesus was um, a bit more willing, let's say, uh, than I am at times. It goes on in the book of Acts, uh, how God is guiding people to do this, to do that. And, and certainly when you, when you read uh, Paul in, in his letters, God is actually telling him where to go. Don't go to this town, go to that town. Well, there, you know, I guess the question becomes, did all of this stop 2,000 years ago? I mean, that's really the question. Or, or did we just stop listening? And that's what Bookman would say, and that's what Benson would say, that we've stopped listening. And so our prayer life really needs to change. And this was key to an understanding of the Oxford group. Um, uh, you know, the Oxford Group was originally called a first century Christian fellowship. And that really appealed to me because what they were attempting to do was get away from doctrines and dogmas, stuff that had been, uh, you know, encrusted onto, onto the life of Jesus. And so it becomes a, a bunch of rules and regulations. And, and, and Jesus gets lost in, the, in that background there. But if you had a first century Christian fellowship, where people were alive, where the spirit was moving, where individuals were touched, where their hearts were on fire. You know, now that's, <laughs> as an addict, that kind of excites me, you know? That's the, that's the kind of faith I was looking for. And I kind of found it in AA. I mean, I really did. I mean, I found people who were on fire. They were alive. And they were actively seeking God's will in their lives. And I was talking about it, but I wasn't really doing it. But these people were really doing it. And that's what made, made them uh, so genuinely attractive to me. Benson writes, um, here's, a, here's a nice quote. The Oxford group stresses the reality of divine guidance in all the affairs of life, sacred and secular, spiritual and temporal. God has a plan for every life, and he will reveal it to us day by day when we fulfill the conditions. So what are the conditions? Um, God guides when we are genuinely willing to do his will. So you got step three. It, it talks about what? Life and will. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we talk enough about will. Uh, we we talk a lot about meetings about the problems in our lives, but what's the condition of our will? Have we re genuinely surrendered our will over to God, that, that he can shape it and move it and direct it? Um, somebody said something really important many years ago to me. He said, 
The purpose of the will is to be willing. And I think that kind of sums it up. The purpose of the will, the purpose of the human will, is to be willing. It's not to assert itself. It's not willpower. It's willingness. And there's a a world of difference uh, between those two conditions. So in step three, we make that initial surrender. Uh, we, we, We turn our will and our lives over to God's care. And then in six and seven, uh, the the surrender becomes deeper. By that point, we're ready to go deeper. It's not just, God, please help me with my drinking problem. I give you my life and my will. But now uh, there's a surrender of our full selves, our sins, our will, our time, our possessions, our ambitions, everything. That's the quote from Benson. Let me read that again. So the group insists upon absolute surrender to God. Ourselves, our sins, our dark side, our will, our time, our possessions, our ambitions, everything. He finishes up, he says, he will guide us into his will for us. Benson then has a quote from Dante. I, I didn't know this quote, but I, I really like it. And, and what it says is, his will, God's will, is our peace. That's so important. His will is our peace. You know, Big Book says, you know, it's a spiritual axiom. Anytime we're disturbed, there's something wrong with us. Well, what's wrong? What's wrong is I have stepped outside of God's will. If I am in God's will, if I am living God's will, if I am seeking God's will, if I am doing God's will, there's a peace that comes with that. My life may may still be a mess in many, many areas, but in some strange way, I am now at peace. It's like I'm in the center of the storm, the center of the hurricane. All sorts of stuff is still whirling around outside of me but I'm okay. I know that I'm okay. Um, Thomas Kelly uh, is a a, a mystic, was a mystic, and he was also a a Quaker. And he he wrote uh, actually in the same year that the the big book was written. And he had a line that I've really come to love. Uh, He says this, where the will to will God's will is present. There is a child of God. Where the will to will God's will is present, there is a child of God. So I just pray for the willingness. uh, And and that's often good enough. Uh, Benson uh, kind of finishes up with a subsection on um, um, some cautions, because it's easy to get, get this thing screwed up and and some people certainly did, and that's, I think, one of the reasons it, uh, it went away. People were receiving guidance. Uh, they take a couple that they're, they're doing their two-way prayer together, and uh, the wife, or, or which, whichever one, uh, or the husband gets this guidance. Hey, Joe or Mary, uh, I got guidance. God wants you to do this, that, or the other thing. Uh, quit smoking. Uh, do this. Do that. Well, that's that's a, a real perversion of what this whole process is about. Um, so so w- that's the first thing, that guidance is for life-changing and for world-changing. It's not for manipulating God. Benson says we must be beware of trying to use God instead of being used by him. Uh, if guidance is used for selfish purposes, it'll gradually become uncertain and reliable. The guidance tends to dry up uh, if we don't follow it. I mean, if, if I'm not doing God's will, why would God bother to keep talking to me? So I, I have to be very careful of this. I'll, I'll get guidance. Do I do the guidance? You know, uh, guidance comes, this is Benson again, guidance comes through a careful study of the scriptures, a clear conscience, the cultivation of the mind of Christ in all things. 
It comes, he says, through the exercise of reason, illuminating thoughts, the circumstances of life, and through the corporate fellowship of guided lives in the church and the groups. So there was a process they called checking. If I get guidance, I check it. First, does it meet the four absolutes? Is it honest? Is it pure? Is it unselfish? Is it loving? If it's not, Dr. Bob said, throw it out. Can't be from God. Um, and Bob said something else that was really interesting. He, he said that, you know, uh, most times the choice, uh, if, a, if a choice is between right and wrong, you, you, don't, you don't need guidance. <laughs> you just need some honesty. Uh, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to do the next right thing. Uh, so it isn't a choice between right and wrong where I need guidance. Where I need guidance is if it's a choice between two things that are right. Then, then I really need this inspiration. I need to know uh, which way would God leave me, lead me. Uh, Benson uh, closes with um, a quote from um, Henry Drummond. And... Um, Drummond was an important writer for the Oxford group people. Uh, he wrote a book called uh, The Greatest Thing in the World. It's a book on love, and it was a commentary basically on 1 Corinthians 13. And in, in, in the fly leaf of, uh, of his Bible, he wrote this, and it was kind of a set of instructions on, uh, on how to know the will of God. So I'm going to go through it real quickly. Uh, seven points to it. First, pray. You want to know the will of God? Pray. Second, think. Big Book says, uh, you know, there's a place for our mind in this, in this process. Third, talk to wise people, but don't regard their judgment as final. The final judgment comes from God. The final gu guidance comes from God. Fourth, be aware of the objection of your own will. Beware of it, but don't be too much afraid of it. God never unnecessarily thwarts a man's nature and likings. It is a mistake to think that his will is always in the line of the disagreeable. God, if I turn my will and my life over to God, there goes all the fun. Nonsense. There starts all the fun. Fifth, meanwhile, do the next thing. For, God, for doing God's will in small things is the best preparation for doing it in great things. Sixth, when decision and action are necessary, go ahead. In other words, make the decision. And it says somewhere else uh, in some other Oxford group writings, don't look back on it. You know, you made a decision. Uh, don't, don't kill yourself over it. You did the best you could. You, you, you checked by the four standards. Do it. Don't, don't rethink it over and over again. Don't second guess. Seventh, you will probably not find out until afterwards perhaps long afterwards, that you've been led at all. God guides. I give you my word for it, but you alone can prove it for yourself in the laboratory of your own experience. So um, I've been trying to live uh, by the standards of honesty, purity, and selfishness and love. I've been trying to do that for 27 years now. And I got to tell you this, my life has taken on a, a wholly different um, a flavor to it. I mean, I got, uh, I got ordained as a priest uh, through guidance. I took a job through guidance. I, I left that same job through guidance. Um, it's, it's, it's a different way of, of living. It's an exciting way of living. And then meeting with a group of people and sharing my guidance with them, uh, doing that on a weekly basis, helping other people to get uh, in touch with this voice within so that they can begin living their lives in a different and, uh, and really, I think, a beautiful, beautiful way that, that God is inviting us uh, to come deeper with him on the journey. So I hope some of this has been helpful. Uh, if it has, please pass this on to a friend and uh, invite you to keep coming back. And thank you for listening. God bless.